Hey, we have a very special service today. I have a, a dear friend here that I've known since uh, he was a little boy that high, and uh, his parents are two of my closest friends. Uh, many of you will remember Donnie and Cherie Sanders. Cherie is the one that sang with me on the hit song Spirit Eyes in 1987, went number one all over the country in the charts, and Donnie was uh, uh, produced that album. His father, he's, he was a sax player, and Whenever Elvis went into the service, his band, the Bill Black Combo, began touring, and Donnie came and toured with them straight out of high school, playing uh, saxophone with them, one of the best saxophonists in the world. And uh, so I've known this family and been very close uh, for over uh, close to 40 years. And uh, so uh, Kathy asked Chris how old he was, and he's like, 40-something. I don't remember. He said, I'm 40-something. So, uh, uh, But I've known him almost 40 years, so uh, he's got to be 40-something. But I believe one of the greatest needs today in the world today is for men and women to answer the call of God. Now, how many in here have been called to the ministry? Okay, the rest of you just have not answered the phone. Because God has called each of us into his kingdom and into his ministry and into his work. But I know that there is the fivefold ministry where God, which I believe personally is the fourfold ministry, but God calls um, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But the pastors and teachers, I believe, is one office that God calls to prepare his people for works of service. And uh, when I was a young boy, in my little church growing up, we had a church. It was a small church, a little Assembly of God church. I can remember four or five of us from my youth group went into full-time ministry and pastor uh, as a result of that church. Four or five kids that I remember out of my youth group, we all became pastors. Now today, it's so rare for me to hear somebody, I mean, Ryan came to see me when he was felt the call of God, Randy and Sue's son, and told me he was called to the ministry. And But other than that, I, I can't remember anybody coming to me and saying, Pastor Keith, I feel called to go into the ministry. Now, if you're here and you do, you can raise your hand and I'll... We'll, uh, we'll let you start preaching today. But, um, uh, but it, I worry about this because what are, who's going to be my grandkids' pastor? You know, who's, who's, who's going to be shepherding this next generation unless men and women start answering the call of God upon their life? The studies that I have read say somewhere between the lowest number is 250 a month, and I've read 1,200 to 1,500 pastors a month are prematurely leaving the ministry today that are resigning because of burnout and they're quitting. Today, it's my happy privilege to ordain Christopher Sanders. Uh, and uh, his, like I say, I've known his parents forever. I've known Chris since he was a little boy. But as we come to this ordination service, we rejoice with Christopher for the call of God upon his life. He lives in Melbourne, Florida, where it's a whole lot warmer. Yesterday, his son was at our house, and he got to see snow for the first time. I saw him out there just reaching down, picking it up. I thought, what's he doing? I said, Chris, has he never seen snow? He said, no. I said, he can take as much home with him as he wants. Scoop up my whole front yard. <laughs> but I'm reminded, um, today I'm going to be presenting a charge to Christopher. In essence, I'm really going to be preaching to one man today, and you guys are just going to, to, to sit in and enjoy it. But I'm reminded of the little country church in North Carolina where a heavy snow fell on a Saturday evening. And on Sunday morning, uh, it, it, they were just drenched like this. The crowd was low, except really there was only one person there that Sunday besides the pastor. The pastor wasn't sure if anybody would show up, but he faithfully made his way to the church. And when he arrived, he found only one man present. Now, thankfully, it was the one man that the preacher had been trying to reach with God's message for the longest time. So the pastor stood that day and he preached to just one man. And he preached everything he felt the Lord had been trying to say to that man. And he went on for at least 45 minutes with his message. And finally, when the service was older, over, the pastor stood at the door and greeted the one man as he was departing and the Young man, the pastor asked the young man, he said, Well, Mr. Brown, what would you think of the message? And the farmer rubbed his chin and he answered, Well, pastor, the message was okay, but I do have a complaint. He said, um, If I don't have but one cow show up at the barn at feeding time, I don't drop the entire load of hay on him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, but today I'm going to drop the entire load of hay on you, my brother. <laughs> I want to read from Second Timothy Chapter 4 and uh, verses 1 through 8 we're going to be talking about this morning. Look at verse 1. In the presence of God 
and of Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Now, hold on. I, there we go. Uh, so Paul's telling Timothy here, he said, in, in light of, of the Lord, in the presence of God and, and Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. I believe with all of my heart that the, the position of pastor, of shepherd, of teacher, is one of the most noble positions in the world. I don't take it lightly. I personally believe I hold an office that is higher than that of President Trump. Amen. Amen. I do. Because I speak for the king. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? And Chris, today I want to remind you that your service and your ministry is to the Lord and not to people. There are so many times when we think that we are just serving people and we can really become burned out and discouraged, but it's really God that we're serving. God uses ordinary people and he raises up men and women who will answer his call. In verse two, the apostle Paul tells this young pastor, now the book of Timothy is one of second Timothy is one of three books in the Bible that we call pastoral epistles. Anybody got any idea why we call them pastoral epistles? They're written to pastors. The book of Titus was written to a pastor. First and second Timothy were written to Pastor Timothy. Now look what Paul says to Timothy in verse 2. He says, Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now, Paul will later tell Timothy that he, he has to preach sound doctrine. He can't turn to myths and fables, but he's to focus on communicating God's message to his people. And then Paul gives him seven ways in which Timothy is to preach the word. This is very important today. I want you to hear this. First thing he tells him was to be prepared in season. Now, this refers to those times when you're supposed to be preaching the word. Sunday morning, I am supposed to be prepared in season. Now, how many have ever heard someone get up to preach and you knew they weren't prepared? I had a pastor one time said, you know, Brother Keith, I don't use notes. I just stand up and open my mouth and let her fly. God will fill my mouth. I'm like, he does with hot air. I think it's very important. That we know what we're talking about when we get up to share with God's people. I'll never forget when I had to confront a very well-known pastor. Talked about it the other day. He got up in my pulpit and shared heresy. And when I confronted him and I said, my brother, this is wrong. He said, well, you know, Keith, I just kind of spoke that off the top of my head. I didn't really study that out. I said, when you're in my pulpit, you don't speak off the top of your head. You know your subject matter. You know what you're talking about. Paul said, Timothy, be prepared in season. There's a, you know, it's it's so important that we study to show ourselves approved. Say amen. Amen. Secondly, he says, and be prepared out of season. Now, what does that mean? How is a preacher supposed to be prepared out of season? I believe this is the time when preaching is not convenient. This is the, the meaning of out of season. It's those times when, when God just brings somebody across your path. And it's not just pastors and teachers. How many in here have ever had God put you in a divine appointment where you just knew you were alone with somebody and God opened the door for you to share the gospel? Sometimes for me, it's on an airplane. I'm sitting next to somebody. I've got a captive audience. They can't move. The seatbelt sign is on. And I start sharing the gospel. And I find that God uses those moments and I got to be prepared out of season. You never know when someone's going to need to hear a word from the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. Sometimes these times are awkward. Sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes they're even resisted. But if we're led by the Holy Spirit, he will bring opportunities across our path where we can share. And sometimes it's just to an audience of one. Then the third thing he says As he says, correct. He said, use the word of God, preach the word and correct. Now, that's not fun. Have you ever had to correct somebody? You know, you just let them go, huh? Well, I bet you had some rowdy kids. I had to correct mine. Paul says, be instant in season and out of season. Then he says, correct. I believe sometimes as pastor, our job is similar to that of an umpire. 
Sometimes people just get off. You know, they're out of bounds. <laughs> they're out of the strike zone. Get what I'm saying? And we got to say, hey, we use the rule book, which is God's word. And we say, hey, this is what God's word says. You can't be doing that. You can't be talking like that. That's not what God says. We have to correct when we see error in the body of Christ. Now listen, my motivational gift, and everybody has a different motivational gift. Some it's administration, some it's, it's uh, various teaching, whatever it is. Mine is exhortation. Mine's encouragement to encourage people. Imagine how difficult it is to correct somebody when your motivational gift is encouraging. I'm like, let me slap you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Has anybody here ever been corrected? Yes. Didn't you appreciate it? Yes. When it's done out of love. <laughs> when it's done out of love. I've had people correct me before. And when they do it out of love, you go like, wow, that hurt, but it hurt so good. The other day, the chiropractor's he's digging in on me and popping me. And he said, does that hurt? I said, oh, but it hurts so good. Hurt me some more. <laughs> then he goes on to the fourth way. He tells Timothy, he said, rebuke. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see the word rebuke, who do you normally think of? Satan, don't you? I rebuke you, Satan. You know, we normally think of the devil, you know. I rebuke you. And yet that term rebuke is a term that means to scold, chide, or correct. It's often used when we encounter the devil. But we're not the enemy of the sinner, nor is the the sinner our enemy. The devil is our enemy. Come on. Remember when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem and then die? Peter spoke up and he said he would prove, never, Lord, this is never going to happen. What did Jesus do? He turned to Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus was rebuking the work of the devil in Peter's lives. It wasn't so much Peter as it was the devil. Peter wasn't the enemy. The devil was the enemy. The fifth thing he told him to do, he said, preach the word and encourage. This is very important to me because... My personal belief is every single Sunday when I stand to minister the word of God, I have one goal in mind. And that goal is to encourage God's people. That when you leave this place, you feel better than you did when you came. See, I grew up under the law. I grew up in a a Pentecostal church where, man, if they didn't preach you hell so hot that you were burning by the time you left, if your ears weren't smoking and your hair wasn't singed, you didn't have a good service. Did anybody else grow up in that? Man, you used to hide under the pew. It was the only safe place to be when the arrows started flying. Man, you go away going, it was a great service. I feel miserable. <laughs> but I love to come and hear God's word and it's apples of gold and settings of silver. You say, man, God's word has a healing, soothing effect on our soul. This word encourage or exhort, it means it involves support, comfort, and aid. And what's so interesting when I was studying this this week, it, it comes from the same word as the Holy Spirit. He's our encourager. A matter of fact, the, the word for the Holy Spirit, the Greek word is paraclete. The word here that he used is parakalesin, from the same root word as comforter or Holy Spirit. I personally view this as the second most important call of my pastor. First is to preach the word. Secondly, my important call is to encourage and make sure that people, because people today are in desperate need of encouragement. Why do we need pastors? We need pastors because we need encouragement. Come on. Is there anybody else besides me that sometimes you come in here on Sunday and you're like, man, I got to get my dose if I'm going to make it through this week. I got to hear me some praise and worship. I got to, I got to get me some encouragement from God's word because the world's cold out there. When you leave church on any given Sunday, you should leave here encouraged. The sixth thing Paul told Timothy in this passage I read to you this morning is he said, preach with great patience. Now that's not always easy because sometimes the people you're serving and in leadership will oppose you. 
And you don't always immediately see the fruits of your labors. Sometimes it takes years or even decades to see the seeds that you've sown come into fruition. But Paul told Timothy, when you're ministering God's word, you minister it with great patience. Amen. You don't see the change always happen overnight. Sometimes it takes time. Then the final seventh thing that Paul said to Timothy here was to preach the word with careful instruction. In other words... When you're preaching, do a little teaching. Walt said that he learned in Bible school that if the point was weak, then make the voice loud. You know, (laughs) if you didn't have a strong point, then at least get loud, you know. (laughs) But I believe it's very important when we're preaching to do some teaching. Make sure there's something that you can learn, some, some truth, some information. And the preaching should include emotion and intellect. You know, I've heard a lot of times people say, leave your brains at the door, you know. That's where Christians get in problems. When they leave their brains at the door, they swallow poison and drink Kool-Aid. Hello. Here in 2 Timothy, notice Paul tells Timothy to preach the word. I think that's so important because I don't know about you, but I talked about this last week. We tune into a lot of Christian preachers today who are preaching anything but the word. It bothers me when I hear someone preach an entire 30-minute sermon, not quote one Bible verse, not take one time to open up God's word. You know what they're doing? They're preaching intellect of men and not the word of God. In his other epistles, Paul tells to us continually that we are to preach the gospel. Not just the Bible, but he says you're to preach the gospel. Now, why do, you, why do I say that? Because how many know that you've heard me say many times, the Bible is a book that contains two religions. It has the book of of the religion of Judaism and it has the religion of Christianity. When I studied Hebrew back in the 80s, I studied Hebrew in the the Jewish community center here with with all the Jewish people. I was the only non-Jew there. And uh, you know what we used as a textbook? The Bible. We would open the Bible and we would begin. Barashit Bahara Elohim. Haaretz, you know, going in at the first created God, the heavens and the earth. And, 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 and we, we use the Bible to study the, the, the word of God. And I remember this one little Jewish girl said, what are you doing here with us? You're a, you know, you're a pastor. You're a Gentile. Why are you here with us Jews? I said, your God is my God. Adonai Elohim. Your Bible is my Bible, the Holy Torah. I said, I just believe Yeshua was, was Mashiach. He was the Messiah. She said, we can handle that. I became an honorary Jew. From that point on, I was a part of the family. You with me? But I understood that their religion is contained in my Bible. So if you don't know how to write... See, Paul told Timothy this. He said, Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What was he talking about dividing? Grace and law. Old covenant, new covenant. Judaism and Christianity. You have to separate the two because there's two different covenants found in our Bible. Do you know that even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still old covenant books because Jesus had not died yet? When did the new covenant begin? When he said, it is finished. Jesus himself was the greatest teacher of the law. He said, you heard it say, don't commit adultery. I tell you, if you even look upon a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart already. He came to put the sting back in the law. But thank God he sent the Apostle Paul to begin to open the new covenant of grace and begin to teach the covenant of grace. So we we, we understand that we are to teach the good news of God's grace. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, this is what Paul said. He said, yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. See, we must preach the good news of God's grace. Now today we're here to ordain Christopher Sanders for the ministry. God has called him to start a a new church in Melbourne, Florida, where it's a lot warmer than it is here today. And before we pray over him and ordain him today, I've asked Christopher to come and share with you his personal testimony so you can understand uh, a little more about what we're doing today, but Chris, come and share this morning before we lay hands on you, my brother. Test. Hello, hello. Can everybody hear me? All right, turn it awesome. Up. Praise God. I'm not used to holding a microphone. I'm used to uh, lapel mic. This is kind of legacy technology to me, uh, but I'll try to make do with it. 
That's right. <laughs> Test one, two. Wow, that sounds good. It's got good sound to it, too. All right. Um, my name is Christopher Sanders. I tell people uh, in Florida that I am a software engineer uh, by day and an evangelist of Jesus by night. But it's, it's a, lot of, a lot's occurred uh, for me to get to this point. And, uh, you know, first, before I even begin talking about that, you know, I just wanted to say that I cannot really express uh, how special of a day this is to be here today, to be with uh, Keith and Kathy, to be here with this body in particular, because our family has just been such close friends and has such a history with this church. And so this is a, this is a gift and a kindness from God to be with you this morning, and we're thankful to him to be here. So with that said, um, Those of you that have been with the church for a long time may know our family. Back when I, well, myself and my siblings, we were born to uh, Donnie and Cherie Sanders who were involved in the ministry and they traveled around the United States. And they were Christian concert uh, musicians and and evangelists for Jesus. And wherever they would accept people who uh, uh, loved Jesus, you know, my parents would go and they would serve God. Um, But by the time I was uh, of age to go to public schools, um, the state of Tennessee required that uh, you either have a master's degree or you enter your kids into school. And as a child, you don't really understand and appreciate the ministry. You don't have strong theological positions uh, or any of that yet. You're just children. And for us, traveling around the United States and being homeschooled, you know, I naturally as a child just wanted to have a normal life, right? Well, I got that chance at that point. And uh, by the age 13, I was smoking. By age 15, uh, drugs and alcohol had begun to get my life. By age 16, our family was going through a very dark time. And my family was splitting up. My mother and my father, their marriage was not going to survive. By the time I was in my 20s, I had already had many encounters with uh, law enforcement. And it was about, but my parents, they love God. You know, my father uh, uh, never stopped serving the Lord and has been a tremendous example to me in my life, even though we go through difficult things. And my mother also has always loved the Lord and has always spoken to my life, both my parents. And uh, I'm going to take a sip of this, if that's okay. And... um, and uh, it was in my 20s sometime, I think, when my mother, uh, well, she was always asking me this. She was, son, come to church with me. No, mom, I'm not interested in going to church. Son, come to church with me. No. Mom, got some stuff going on today. No, mom, I'm not interested. And then one day she came to me, it was, uh, and, and it was Mother's Day. And she said, it's Mother's Day, come to church with me. And I said, well, I'm a jerk, but I'm not that big a jerk. (laughs) And so I came to church with my mother. And as I was uh, sitting in the service, uh, I I wasn't paying any attention to the pastor and what he was saying at this point. And, you know, but God was speaking to me as I was sitting there. God was working with me while I was sitting in the audience. And I, I, I exited the service and I went to the men's room and I, you know, I just, I just said a quiet prayer to God in that stall, and it was completely private. And I said, Lord, I, I can't live up to your standard. I can't, I, I, I can't imagine myself being able to do, to, to, to meet your expectations and your standard of living. If I'm going to make it into your kingdom, God, you're going to have to do this. And just a simple, honest prayer to the Lord. And I, I went back into the service and I sat down. You know, I wish I could sh- show you what I looked like. <laughs> um, that pastor started speaking my heart right out of his mouth. And, and God intervened in a special way that day. And I glorified God and I spoke in tongues. And, you know, God just read my book. And... 
I didn't realize it at the time because my knowledge of the Lord was not that deep. But that was the day that the God of the Bible began revealing himself to me as the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible says, pray to me in secret and I will reward you openly. And it's not always the prayers that we pray from our great wisdom and intellect that impress God and that God answers. The Lord said, he heard the sinner. That's whose prayer he heard, the sinner's prayer. Amen? I didn't understand what happened to me. I rationalized. I said, I got emotional. You know, I, I, uh, I spoke in tongues because, you know, my history, I guess maybe I thought that's what I was supposed to do at that point in time. I was still, I went out into the world, I still tried to live my life as I, I was living it according to the knowledge I had because my, all the knowledge that I had was the same, right? My life, the people that I knew, my circumstances, they didn't change. But life wasn't working out anymore the way it used to because I didn't realize it, but God had changed something in me that day. And God had given me a new nature. And God had put his spirit in me. And God had a different plan for my life. You know. And so I made the decision to, to uh, go back to school. And during that time, I met my wife. And uh, we were married. Uh, we had our first son. His name's Christian. He's 15 years old. He wears a size 15 shoe. He bends down to hug dad. And he brings me great honor everywhere he goes. He's a special child. God gave me gold when he gave him to me. And so I'm in college, getting my uh, bachelor's of science from the College of, uh, of Computer Science and Engineering at Tennessee State University and supporting my family. And, you know, before I uh, got out of college, you know, I, I uh, was recruited by uh, a communications and technology company out on the Space Coast in Florida. And I went to work for Florida. I was there 12 years to today. Uh, but seven years after I had my first time, well, uh, first son, while I was in Florida, I had Aiden, and Aiden, uh, uh, who's here with us today, he, you know, he's the true Floridian. That's why you never saw snow, Pastor, right? And um, so, but I got to a point. I grew professionally, and I got to a point uh, where it was still not enough. God had blessed me. God had blessed me. God had, had done exactly what he promised that he would do in Isaiah 55, right? God had, had he, he was the God of the Bible. And he blessed me everywhere in my life. He blessed me with a wonderful wife. He blessed me with children and provided a means for me to uh, uh, take care of my family. And we don't have any personal needs. God's been good. You know, but I was beginning to feel a bit empty. You know, and I began to pray to God on my back patio. And I said, Lord, I said, is this it? Is this what you want me to do with my life? You know, just you know, take care of my family and, you know, be a good engineer. You know. And uh, it was at that moment that God caused me to remember uh, a prophecy that I received uh, when I used to travel with my family. Uh, and we were in uh, uh, at Bill... Swads Church out in Ohio. And I'm not sure. Well, there's two prophecies that I heard when I was traveling with my parents in ministry. One was, you're going to preach the word of God, and you're going to serve God, and you're going to have a unique ministry. That's the first one. And, and it was very easy at the time for me to reason how people would tell me that. And then it, there was another one, and I'd only received it once. And at the time, I was pretty sure it was all wrong. <laughs> right. And he said that I was going to work for the government during a time of war, and then it was going to have something to do with planes. Right? And so when I was praying this prayer on my back patio, God brought that prophecy to my memory, and I was just humbled. Because God knew 30 years before I would pray that prayer, and one of the major concerns that I had was, God, did I mess up your plan for my life? Did I, did I stay in the world too long? Did I do 
too much? Did I mess it up? Or is this what you really want for me? You know? And, um, and, and when God spoke that, I was like, this is the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible knows the end from the beginning. Right? Only the God of the Bible can answer a prayer in that manner. Right? And so, but I didn't read too much into it. I couldn't read anything into it more than what God had revealed. And that is, is that God's the one in control. God's sovereign. Right? And, uh, but it was not too long after that. Our family was at the, uh, uh, at the doctors, you know, getting the children their wellness checkups. And they told us about a new flu vaccine. And uh, they told us, uh, 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 and I thought about all of our visits to Nashville to see our loved ones and how many times, because you get all these kids together, you know, you get sick, right? That we had gotten the flu. And so we decided, oh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and get flu vaccinated. And it was at that moment that my child was vaccine injured. Aiden, who's here with us today. His third, fourth, and fifth cranial nerves were paralyzed, and his, 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 his pupil was down and off to the left, and his eye was t- shut tight. And God had been good to me over the years, and God had been moving. In do- it, he had been involved in my life through special means. We call it grace, right? And the sovereignty of God where we have a, a all-powerful, all-loving God who is full of grace and compassion, who is orchestrating events in our life to bring us to where he wants us to be. And in this moment, though, I'm faced with a, a clear situation where I'm powerless and where I know the doctors are powerless, too, because they let us out of the hospital with his eye just as shut when we showed up. And when my wife asked him, oh, he's going to be better in two weeks after he takes the, the medication, Right. They just gave her a blank stare back, right? But we knew someone who speaks very confidently about these things. You know, the Bible says, call me, call on me in your day of trouble, and I will cause you to glorify me. And this is the God of the Bible. And I was, I was frantic, and I searched desperately as I was going through this time as an engineer looking for uh, information, trying to link this, uh, trying to link that, and trying to figure out how do I help my son. And I, I found a white paper on, on this, and I found a, another mother who was the mother of a, uh, a three-year-old child when she reached out on the Internet. But it was, years had passed, and it was... Uh, her, her daughter, I think, was six or nine years old at the time that this was going on in my life. And I reached out to her and spoke with her. And she told me what had happened to her daughter, that her daughter had to have two surgeries, one to realign the eye, one to open the eye. Right? And she showed me pictures. And her eye was not what God created. You know? And my heart began to sink. And she told me how she was a Christian and how she knew everything that I was going to go through. And, and what the outcome would be, and, and let me hook you up with my surgeon. You know. And so I was in a moment where I was, you know, in a dark place. I didn't have a lot of great faith. I was thinking thoughts for the first time. You know, God, I might be in something. I might be in a fight for the long haul. There may, I may be in an uphill battle, and there's no good outcome here. You know. And as I began to recount with my cousin... I was speaking with my cousin, Steve Coe. He's a, he's a man of God. He loves the Lord. I'm so blessed to have so many family members that know God. And I was speaking with him, and I began to recount everything that God had done in my life up until that point in time. But before I was done counting, I was just as convinced that God would not let that stand as I was convinced just before that I might be looking at a situation in my life that I can't get out of. That I can't, there's no deliver. There's no deliverance for this. And, um, you know, to, to, to make a long story short, we, we anointed our son in the name of Jesus. And we prayed for him, like John, James 5, 13. We said the prayer of faith because we believed that God was going to heal him. And God opened my son's eye. When you see my son here tonight, you're seeing God's uh, concept of patient recovered, Right? You're seeing the work of God and God's faithfulness. You know, this, this young lady, and I, I love that woman on the phone, right? I had, the faith that I had was based on what I knew about God, based upon what God was doing in my life, not what God was doing in other people's lives. You know, you know it, we, can't, we can't, 
you know, you've got, to, you've got to stand on God's promises. And you've got to make an evaluation on, on, on whether God, because we don't know, right? We don't know what's going on. And I, I, I've got no judgment for that lady. I love her, right? But I have, I can't, I, that's not the truth, right? That's not the truth that I live by, right? The truth that I live by is in God's word, right? It's only God's word that shines bright like the sun when it's the most dark, right? You know, and, and God has, was faithful and he honored that, right? And so, uh, so after that happened, uh, uh, I began to grow tremendously in God, right? God began to open my eye to much more of what he was saying in his word. And I began to uh, preach in, in, in uh, Melbourne, uh, right now at the uh, uh, men's rescue mission there. You know, but there's a, there's a couple of things, I guess, that I want to tell you that I may have skipped over. Number one, if you looked up that lady, that her child's VAERS ID in the database, uh, so there's a VAERS database. I'm not sure if you know this. It's Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. The government set it up. And by law, when something like this happens in relation to vaccine, uh, they have to report it. Right, and for her child inside that database, it says patient recovered. Okay, but 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 my son, the testimony of my life, what God's done in my life is the contrast that He's shown me is His version of patient recovered, His version of faithfulness. Right, and it's that God that I'm. He's the reason I'm here today to honor the God of the Bible, just like He said. When he said, uh, call on me in your day of trouble, and I will cause you to honor me, right, and to glorify me. And so, uh, so, so why I'm here today, what we're doing here today, is at the hands of God. God's orchestrated this. And God has put it within my heart to honor him in Palm Bay, to do a work for him, and to honor him before men in Palm Bay. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what this next chapter is going to be like. But I can tell you this much. I know that he's going to be a part of it. He's going to be the biggest part of it. Right? And that I'm going to, with his help, and if he will keep me, that I'm going to serve him faithfully in everything that he assigns to me. And I believe in my heart that whatever we see come out of this in Florida, Whatever we see happen in Palm Bay, that we're going to see the results of a mighty, all-powerful, all-sovereign, loving God whose salvation lasts to every generation. It stretches, stretches out to every generation. That's what I believe is going to happen. And that is the hope that God has put in my heart. And not just my heart, right? You know, Pastor Keith mentioned something just a moments ago, you know, that God calls all of us. And this is not a one-man show, right? You know, God didn't take us out of the world when he blotted out the separation, right? He gave us his spirit. Because God's plan and purpose for us is to be a light in a dark place, right? And though there's fewer people signing up for the job than ever before, right? Though there may be 800 prophets of Baal, Right. There's a God in heaven who reigns sovereign and who is still raising men today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the darker that it gets in this world, the brighter God's people are going to shine. Right. And so the calling that you see here today, the ordination and what you see going on here today, and we're just celebrating what God's doing. That's all we're doing. We're celebrating our God. Right. Okay. This is the calling and the purpose that God has placed upon his people. And it is together. God says together we are his temple. And that God inhabits his temple. And it's through all the gifts that God gives to his people when he gives them this treasure called his Holy Spirit. When God puts his spirit in you, when he, get, when he blots out the separation and he puts his spirit in you, he didn't just put his spirit in you alone. He gave you gifts. He gave you uh, all of his promises, right? And he's given you a new purpose. He didn't just erase the old nature, 
just to make you a good person that attends church every Sunday and, you know, follows a bunch of rules, right? God has an exciting purpose and call upon your life. And together, only together, right, are you going to realize that? Are we going to realize that, right? And so, and so, so, so after today and what you're doing today, when you send me off, right, Send me off to Florida, to Palm Bay, Florida, with the hope and the prayer that the God of the Bible is going to plant a candlestick in Florida. And that the God of the Bible is going to shine in Florida. Hallelujah. And that God will give, get great glory out of what he's done. Amen. And that God will keep me. And that God will strengthen me. And where the enemy has stolen in our past, that God is going to more than redeem that. And he's going to more than, he's going to change it all for good. Hallelujah. I am so glad to be with you today. I'm so glad to be with you for this purpose. I praise God Almighty. His hand is, his hand is, just one too. (laughs) His hand is over my life and everything in my life. And for those of you that know our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and he's a part of your life, uh, you, you understand what I'm talking about. When you see the fingerprints of God. Right. Praise God. So, so happy to be with you all. There you go, brother. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to ask Pastor Walt, Pastor Dan and Tom, would you come as well? And we're going to anoint Christopher today and pray over him. What an honor it is to uh, to be able to see God's handiwork in the lives of men. Amen. And uh, I'm expecting great things. We've been talking about this for a long time and uh, what God is going to do there in in, uh, northeastern Florida in Christopher's life and in his family and in that community. I believe God's going to do a a, a great and mighty work. Amen. Would you stretch your hand this way as we pray over him today and believe God for a mighty work? Put your hands up to the Lord, Christopher. Christopher. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I anoint Christopher today in obedience to your word. We as a church this day, we set him apart according to your word. God, it is you that calls and not man. And I know God from the time Christopher was a young boy, you placed a call upon his life. Father, in the name of Jesus, this day we set him apart. We ordain him according to your word. God, we ask that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon his life. Father, as he stands to minister to people, whatever you open the door, whatever opportunity you bring, God, I pray that there shall be an anointing that you would put words within his heart to share. And God, in the name of Jesus, the times that he will need, God, you will bring forth the finances. You will make every provision as he begins this ministry and this work. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we set him apart. We pray in Jesus' name that your power would bring forth glory and honor to Yeshua Jesus. And we give you praise and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Come on, give the Lord up some praise. Hallelujah. 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 Give the Lord a praise. Come on. Amen. Amen. So now that I'm 60 years old, I get to do stuff like that. I'm not young. Once I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being a part of this service today. Chris, thanks for coming and flying up with Aiden to be, uh, to be with us today. And we're just so, so excited about what God is doing. I'm believing God for some great, uh, great things to happen there in Florida. And we'll hear a good report.